we'll talk about discrete random variables. These have a finite number of possible outcomes, so they could be very simple. Coin flip. Either the outcome is heads or tails. If I roll a six-sided dice, the outcome is one, two, three, four, five, six. I can make a list of what are the possible outcomes. Later, we'll get to continuous distributions where the possible outcomes might be, say, any real number. But in this case, there's a finite number of possible outcomes. We can count them up. We denote the expected value, e of x, as mu, common bit using that Greek letter to represent the mean. The mean expected value of a discrete random variable is the sum of the probability of each of those occurrences times the value of x when the occurrence happens. That gives the mean. It's exactly what you were calculating back when you were a baby figuring out the average or something. The variance is going to be the difference from the mean, the squared distance from the mean, times the probability of that particular thing occurring. Note that's the variance, so standard deviation is square root. Next we have the rules of linear transformations, which work pretty much the way we'd like them to. If we have some variable x, which is a discrete random variable, and we want to create some new variable w as ax plus b, then the mean of w is going to be a times the mean of x plus b. Standard deviation of w is going to be a times the standard deviation of x. Drop the b in that case. If I have two random variables x and y, not necessarily independent, the two variables x and y added to create z as the sum, then the mean of z is going to be the mean of x plus the mean of y, and the standard deviation is going to be that complicated formula there. The square root of the variance of x plus the square uh, variance of y plus twice the covariance of x and y. If x and y are independent, then the covariance term is zero, so that just drops out. Sadly, these do not work for nonlinear transformations. If it's multiplied, then these nice little formulas don't work out. If I divided, no, no easy formula. You can be grateful for the nice formulas we have, but don't get too crazy and get fooled in thinking that all the mathematical formulas are going to play nice. It's only the linear ones that do. Let's talk about some common discrete random variables that we often use. The uniform distribution comes up quite a lot. That's where there's the same probability of each outcome. Think about a six-sided dice. We'd like to believe that each side has the same probability coming up. Probability of getting one is the same as probability of getting a six, same as probability of rolling a four, you know, etc. It's a basic assumption we'd like to make to pay, play fair games. We'll be working in class about how to modify that to discover how easy or difficult that is, but we'll naturally state a null hypothesis for rolling dice to be the distribution should be uniform. There are lots of cases where I can specify the null hypothesis as saying that we would expect a, no, a uniform distribution of outcomes. Now, there are some cases where our raw intuition might be misleading. One of the classics is Benford's Law, which basically states where we have measurements of a thing, then we're more likely to see leading values 1 or 2 than to see values like 8 or 9. So sometimes you might think a measurement should have a uniform distribution. It might actually not work out that way. We'll come back to that later. Another common discrete random variable we use is Bernoulli which is where there's just one thing, and either that one thing happens or it doesn't happen. There's two outcomes. Either something happens or not. Without loss of generality, we'll call the value when it happens to be 1, and the value when it doesn't happen to be 0. You can put in any other values with a bit of a linear transformation. With these formulas we just reviewed, calculate the mean and variance. And if we have multiple, multiple Bernoulli trials, then again use the formulas for linear combinations. If the probability of a single occurrence happening is p, then the mean is p, and the standard deviation is the square root of p times 1 minus p. This is used for lots and lots of different events that have a yes-no answer, such as in the data sets we've been playing around with. Does a person have health insurance? Is yes or no? Do they live in a particular location? Yes or no. Education? Yes or no. Medical diagnosis? Yes or no. With a bunch of Bernoulli trials, we get a binomial distribution recording the sum of how many were 1 or not 0. The mean of that is n times p, where the standard deviation is the square root of n times p times 1 minus p. Those are easy to derive from the rules of linear combinations. The only tricky thing is sometimes people talk about the sum of the variables, how many are yes, 
Or sometimes they're talking about the fraction that are yes. For example, if I have 100 Bernoulli trials and 60 of them come up success, then I might that is record that as 60, or I might record that as 60% or 0.6. Math don't care. Either one works, which is why sometimes people might have one or the other inside their head, but not successfully communicate, you know, getting what's inside the head onto the outside world. Got to keep an eye on it. One of the common occurrences where we see binomial distributions used is looking at political polls. People say they'd vote for some candidate or support some issue or not. Define voting one way as a success, voting the other way as a fail. Again, it doesn't really necessarily matter which one you count as a success. But that's where the plus or minus two percentage points stipulation, that comes from the formulas for linear combinations. In the notes, I go through more detail. You should make sure you understand that. With a lot of Bernoulli trials, then we get going to form into coefficients given by Pascal's triangle. We can derive a formula for that that gives us, at the limit of n goes to infinity, a normal distribution. We'll go do that next.